It's an idea most every avid reader or writer has had at least once. What if the characters before me on the page stepped out of the confines of their fictional world and intruded upon our reality? Or what if they're already here? It's an irresistible concept and certainly one explored many times in literature, on television, and in the movies. If not handled well, it can come off as inauthentic and predictable. If handled with a deft touch, it can challenge and fascinate the audience who hopefully might soon begin to wonder if their reality is being invaded by fictional villains and monsters. This is the world that Tibor Takis's I, Madman inhabits. And yes, it's one of the films that handles this idea with a deft touch. It's also, to this day, underappreciated by all but the most diehard horror fans. We aim to change that with a new edition of the best horror movie you never saw, I, Madman. Let's go back to 1987, which was a pretty darn good year for some soon-to-be classic horror movies. Hellraiser, The Lost Boys, Predator, Evil Dead 2, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, just to name a few. Floating somewhat under the radar is The Gate, an unnerving little movie about children who awaken a bevy of demons and other horrifying visions in the middle of their suburban backyard. Now, anyone who is a burgeoning horror fan in the 80s will tell you that while Freddy Krueger, Pinhead, and all those guys were sort of scary at the time, The Gate was one of the movies that provided some real nightmare fuel. Part of that was the fact that it was kids who were being brutally terrorized in the film, and a big part of that was those nasty little minions running loose, genuinely creepy ghouls who still send shivers up this writer's spine. I'm not lying when I say I was afraid to look under my bed most nights because you never knew if you'd see those beady little eyes staring back at you. The Gate was a modest success at the time, making double its budget and also making a name for its 32-year-old director, Tibor Takix, who showed ingenuity and a knack for crafting unsettling visuals on a modest amount of money. Soon after The Gate hit, Takix was sent plenty of horror scripts to tackle as a follow-up. Most of them were either the same exact vein as The Gate or they were the kind of routine slasher stuff that had began peering out at the box office. When vacationing with his wife in Palm Springs, Takix read the script for I, Madman, which was certainly not like the others. An homage film noir and pulp novels with a gruesome horror twist, I, Madman looked like it could be something unique, an intelligent horror film about monsters, both real and imaginary. Plus, it was different enough from the gate to ensure Tibor would not just be rehashing himself. Written by Nightmare on Elm Street 2 scribe David Chaskin, I, Madman, tells the story of Virginia, a quiet bookstore employee who has a fondness for trashy but engrossing paperbacks. Her latest obsession is the work of Malcolm Brand, an author who only wrote two books, both of them incredibly disturbing, both with great titles, much of madness, more of sin, and I, Madman. The movie opens with Virginia's vivid imagination getting the best of her as she reads. Much of Madness, a boffo beginning for a movie that alternates between big moments of horror and subtle sequences of creeping dread. We quickly see that Virginia just might be someone who lets her imagination get the better of her, which naturally will put into question every weird thing that happens to her from here on out. With much of Madness in the bag, Virginia feels the need to read Brand's rare follow-up I Madman, and wouldn't you know it, she fortunately gets a copy sent to her, the first of many suspicious occurrences. I Madman tells the story of an insane former doctor who cuts off his entire face being spurned by the object of his affection, Anna, an actress. Looking for a new face, the doctor goes about the city crudely, slicing up innocent bystanders and taking the necessary features. Hair, a new nose, some lips, a nice pair of new ears. The usual. Ultimately, this morbid display surprisingly doesn't buy Anna's affection, so the doc finds there's no other way to get her heart than to cut it out and wear it around his neck. And they say true love is dead. Well, as our heroine Virginia delves into this nasty bit of business, she starts having some very troubling experiences. 
She sees glimpses of the villain around Los Angeles. Even worse, people start showing up dead. People she knows. A rival actor gets scalped. And did we mention Virginia is an up and coming actress, not unlike the fictional Anna? A neighbor gets his ears hacked off. A friend loses his nose. It all starts adding up for Virginia, but will the cops, who include her disbelieving boyfriend, buy any of this? Has the character from the book jumped into our reality, or is it a very real person using the book as a ghastly guidebook? Or just maybe Virginia has lost her ever-loving mind after reading one too many horror books. That's what our parents always said would happen if we kept reading those, right? Part of the fun of I, Madman is that guessing game, and like any good amateur detective story, we're meant to play sleuths along with Virginia as she puts the pieces together, even as things start getting worse for her and those around her. Of course, we horror fans know Virginia's not crazy, but which of the many possible explanations is going on here? Chaskin's Nightmare on Elm Street 2 screenplay might be infamous for all the wrong reasons, but I, Madman is definitely the work of someone with strong appreciation for stories about nightmares, daydreams, and the potentially deadly power of the imagination. That Chaskin has said he's always been a lover of Pulp Fiction adds to his engagement in the tale. Another huge benefit is Tibor's clever direction. With this in the gate, the man proved he really had a talent for the genre, and it's always been a shame he didn't become a bigger name in the industry. Effortlessly sliding in and out of reality, Tibor delivers some terrific sequences straight out of a 40s film noir, although of course they're a bit more stylized and colorful. The costume and production design are top-notch for a movie with this tight of a budget, and the director makes the most of the City of Angels as his backdrop no better place for a lurid tale such as this one. The movie is well cast too, populated by entertaining characters and interesting faces. Especially convincing is the police force that attempts to aid Virginia despite their doubts. These guys all look like real coppers. Speaking about the cast allows us to pivot to actress Jenny Wright, who plays Virginia. There are plenty of conflicting opinions on Wright's performance, and it's not disingenuous to argue that people who love her performance and people who dislike it both have valid points. Wright plays Virginia with a soft-spoken, almost mousy veneer. Despite her beauty, the character is often awkward and understated. This is not the fiery final girl we've seen in Nancy and Elm Street or Christy and Hellraiser, but a reserved and self-conscious young woman, and Wright's acting frequently bounces between believable and, let's say, unexciting. No one will ever say Virginia is their favorite horror movie heroine, at least I doubt anyone will say that, but in a way, the performance works for the material. She's the shrinking violet who looks out of place in the big bad city, but also not necessarily a stereotypical good girl either. Her obsession with those dirty dime store novels is one thing and her overt attraction to her detective boyfriend adds another layer stating she isn't some prude either. Regardless of your opinion of her acting chops, Wright creates a protagonist who does indeed belong in this peculiar world. As always, a movie like this will only work if the villain is a memorable one, and Malcolm Brand is indeed quite a guy. Played by makeup whiz and future Oscar winner Randall William Cook, who applied his own makeup, Brand begins the film a scarred, freakish doppelganger of Nosferatu and ends up, well, still scarred and freakish, but with an increasingly horrifying new look as he puts himself back together. His voice is really quite chilling, and those evil eyes could burn holes through a 500-page book. Whether or not he's a fictional character come to life, or a real-life madman, Malcolm is a hypnotizing figure. Not unlike the movie, it's a bit of a shame the character is not more well-known. I'd like to see more little kids dressed as Dr. Brandt for Halloween, damn it. We'd be remiss if we didn't touch upon the other memorable character inhabiting I, Madman. Although he bookends the movie with only a few minutes of screen time, he is a startling creation. Looking more than a little like those evil little bastards in the gate, the Jackal Boy is an awesome bit of stop-motion animation work by Randall Cook and a perfect final bit of WTF to conclude this fantastical story on. The movie's momentum brings it from film noir to detective story to slasher flick to full-on monster movie and what's not to love about that. 
It occurs to me that I, Madman is a movie out of time and place. It probably didn't fit into the marketplace back in the late 80s, and it doesn't really fit in now, with appreciation for pulp novels and film noir likely not at an all-time high. But that's the part of the movie's appeal. It can't be accused of being just like everything else you see on a daily basis. It creates an indelible world of its own, populates it with familiar cliches, and has a ball unending our expectations as to what will happen next. It's also the kind of horror movie that makes you grateful it didn't have any sequels. Had it been a massive success, sure, we would have seen Dr. Brand terrorize a series of bookish young ladies throughout the early 90s, but sometimes it's nice to have just the one, making it all the more special.